The Gordian Knot, a spy story with a difference. The Gordian Knot is a work of fantasy and a work in progress. So thank you for watching. And any resemblance to real events or persons is purely coincidental. Chapter 6. Valeri and Sudui. Valeri's car moved slowly through the early afternoon traffic of the Central Boulevard. The radio was broadcasting the news. Constantine had one hand on the steering wheel and one on the gear stick. Valeri was sitting in the back. He fished out a piece of paper from the inside pocket of his jacket. He looked at the names arranged in the neat column. Perhaps he should have given the list to Poppy and George. He folded the list back up and put it back in his pocket. Have you heard from Sudoi? No, sir, Constantine replied from the front. Valeri pulled out his mobile phone. He scrolled down to Sudoi's number. The phone was ringing. Valeri laid back in his seat. Sudoi was never fast answering his phone these days. He had explained to Valeri that only servants rushed to answer a machine, and he was no one's servant. Hello, Valeri set up, Malina. It's Valeri. I, I was looking for your father. The other, Malina said on the edge of tears, he was attacked. Where are you? Valeri asked. I'm at the hospital. I'm waiting for the doctors to tell me something, Malina said. I'll be there as soon as possible, Valeri replied. They are coming out, Malina said and hung up. Constantine, change of plan. We are going to the hospital, Valeri instructed. While Constantine drove through the traffic like a shark with a scent of blood in his nose, Valeri was on the phone, issuing instructions. Constantine stopped by the back entrance of the hospital next to a private ambulance. A man in blue overalls was standing by it. Valeri grabbed his walking stick and got out of the car. Is everything ready? Valeri asked. Yes, sir. Private room. And as you asked, I booked Olga to be his nurse. Good. Thank you. Come with me now, Valeri said. As Valeri walked up to the double doors, a man in white overalls opened them. Valeri slipped his small bundle of notes in his hand. No one needs to know about this, Valeri said, tapping his stick on the ground. The man shook his head. The trio stepped inside the service elevator. It rattled and ground, and with a final jolt, it stopped. The doors slowly opened. The man in white overalls led them to the end of the corridor. Valeri gestured to his companions to wait outside. He pushed the door open. Sudoi's daughter was sitting by the side of the bed. Valeri had to remind himself that Malina was a grown-up woman now. Even so, in his heart, she was still a little scrawny girl who climbed up trees instead of playing with dolls. Sudoi was laying in the bed, a stitched-up gash above his right eyebrow. His right eyelid puffed up and an angry purple colour. The whole right side of his face went from dark yellow to a dark violet. His right forearm down to the base of his finger was in a plaster. His fingers looked like overstuffed blood sausages against the crispy white of the hospital sheets. Malina, how is he? Valeri asked softly. He has two broken ribs, a broken wrist, and a nasty gash on his forehead. The doctor said that he was kicked badly, Malina said. If I catch whoever did this, Malina hissed, venom dripping from every syllable. You will do nothing, Valeri said, gently putting his hand on Malina's shoulder. Listen to Valeri, little star, Sadoi murmured. Malina gently touched the tip of Sadoi's black and blue fingers. Papa, she murmured. Let me talk to Valeri, Sadoi said. A range of emotions struggled on Malina's face. Eventually she sighed, stood up and stepped back from the bed. Valeri took her seat. I went to get my taxi ready when he jammed me. I never saw his face, Sadoi said. Malina helped Sadoi to a sip of water. I'm all right, little star. Please go outside while I talk to Valeri, Sadoi said. Malina crossed her arms, clearly annoyed but did as her father had asked. He was about my height, medium built, quick on his legs, and good upper body strength, Sadoi said. 
Valerie picked up the glass of water left by Marlene on the bedside table. No water, Sedoy said. He was trained by us, Sedoy continued, and he wanted to make sure I could not drive. Valerie looked at Sedoy's arm encased in the plaster. But I landed a good one too, Sedoy cracked a smile. Not as good as the one that gave you that limp. But he will walk with a limp for a couple of weeks, Sedoy stated. He coughed. Valeri helped him to another sip of water. I have a room for you at the private hospital. Olga will be looking after you there, Valeri said. You called Olga. The situation has changed then, Sedoy said. Someone picked up Poppy and George at the airport and took them to me, Valeri answered. It was meant to be a routine plan. Get a couple of old operatives from the other side of the fence. They knew how to play along and got them to gather enough evidence on a few individuals that were making a nuisance of themselves. And he had arranged for the evidence to be there. Those individuals had already been dispatched to Velika Tonova to spy on the ammunition factory there. Poppy and George were meant to prepare a report the report would then be shared with the Bulgarian government who would proceed to expel the undesirable. They may lose a few more people than expected in the process because Dance would want to look into it and probably add a few names to the list of persons to be expelled, but the inconvenience caused by losing some useful bodies was worth it if it meant ensuring that the embassy's hand in the whole affair remained hidden. We may have underestimated this situation, Valeria agreed. He stood up and opened the door. The doctors here have confirmed that the patient can be moved, the man that had met them at the back entrance of the hospital said. Valeria looked at the stretcher and at the two men in yellow jackets standing by it. Melina, you go with your dad in the ambulance. He took her hand. Don't worry, your father is going to be looked after. I've made sure of it, he added. Valeri left them and I headed back to his car. Constantine was sitting behind the steering wheel. Valeri got into the back. How is he? Constantine asked. Bruised and battered, but he will live, Valeri said. There are two players we know little about. One is the man with the nicked ear that picked up Pop in George. The other one has recently developed a nasty limp. Valeri paused. You still go to the gym, he added. Tuesday and Thursday night, Constantine confirmed. You are looking for someone that should be there, but is not. Am I looking for one of ours? Constantine asked. Valeri listened carefully to the slight changes in Constantine's voice. There was a hint of disapproval there, but nothing jumped out at him. He decided that, for the time being, he would keep trusting Constantine. Sedoy recognised the fighting patterns. He thinks the assailant was taught by one of our trainers. My generation, Valeri added. Constantine tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. I think that there are four, perhaps five, regulars at the gym that fit, he said. Anything on the scanner but an abandoned taxi, Valeri asked. Nothing, Constantine replied. Valeri's cold. I need to find Sedoy's taxi, quickly. There is no other option. I will have to accept whatever price she puts on it, Valeri murmured. Sir, please just drive around for a while, Constantine. Thank you, Valeri said. He scrolled through his contacts and there it was, Makov. Poppy had added her number to his phone book without him even noticing. Of course he expected nothing less from her and George, but he could not help feeling a little annoyed. Valeri typed, where is Sedoy's taxi? and hit send. The reply was nearly instantaneous. Who is your contact? Valeri called at the message on his phone, but decided to try anyway. There is no contact, he typed. Try again, Poppy replied. Ask George, Valeri typed. Close, but no cigar. Valeri's index finger hovered over the on-screen keyboard. It's a tall order. The boss doesn't know, he typed. He watched the three dots dancing underneath his message. A screenshot of a map with longitude and latitude appeared. He tapped on Constantine's shoulder and showed him the screen. We are going there, Valeri said. 
Considine changed lanes. Valeri sat back. Another message flashed on the screen. Pick up my phone, will you? It's under the driver's seat. They left Sofia proper behind. Constantine drove past a mixture of light industrial units and squat apartment blocks. They turned into a village that was about to be gobbled up by the growing city. He proceeded slowly as the tarmac began to crumble and gave way to a dirt road. And there it was, parked on the verge by a crumbling wall of a long abandoned farmhouse. Valerian Constantine walked up to Sidoi's taxi. It's unlocked, Constantine said. Valeri looked at the seat, then he kneeled on the ground and looked at the pedals. He ran a finger on the clutch, looked at the dust, then smelled it. Seat your walker, Valeri stated. He watched Constantine getting comfortable. What do you think? Constantine looked at the wing mirrors, then the rear view mirror. About one meter seventy-five, he said. He gingerly put a hand inside a door bin pulled out a scrunch-up candy wrapper. He unfolded it and passed it to Valeri. I know the brand. They're good for sore throats and dry cough, he said. Constantine went fishing again, but this time he slid his hand by the side of the seat. He pulled out a triangular bit of paper. It feels like money, he said, passing it to Valeri. Valeri felt it with his fingers, then looked at it. It's from a 50-level note, and by the feel of it, a fairly new one. Next, Constantine flipped down the sun visor and pulled out a small business card. It's from a kebab restaurant, he said, passing it to Valeri. Constantine continued the examination. I cannot find anything else, he said eventually. He got out of the car. Before I forget, Valeri said. He opened the passenger door and slid his arm under the driver's seat and picked up Poppy's phone. Do we have a charger for this thing? he asked. Constantine looked at the bottom of the phone. I think so. They went back to their car. Constantine opened the glove compartment. Valeri looked at the neatly coiled cables and remembered that Constantine had a thing about throwing away cables, which was never throw away a cable. They should fit, he said, picking one up and passing it to Valeri in the back. Valeri connected up the power cable to the port in the back, then to the phone. A message flashed up. Recordings. He opened up the voice memos folder. There were five memos taken at 15 minutes intervals. We have been here far too long already. We better get moving, Constantine, Valeri said, then pulled out a pair of cheap earphones and plugged them in. He listened to a recording after the other. It was a disappointing collection of car and traffic noises and the occasional coughing and sneezing. Nick Deer clearly suffered from hay fever. The last recording began playing. Valeri listened carefully, then rewinded it and listened again. His face was a blank wall. Anything of interest? Constantine asked. Valeri pulled out the headphones. No, just car noise, he said. They rejoined the main road back to Sofia. It's getting late, Valeri said. You might as well drop me home and go to the gym. Valeri sat in silence. He had recognised one of the voices on the last recording. He reminded himself that only fools rushed into action. Actually, Constantine, Natasha asked me to pick up cake layers. Could you please drop me off at the Paradise Mall? A little bit about Bulgarian mannerism. When Bulgarians shake their heads, it means yes or da. They shake their heads also to indicate that they understand what you're saying and please go on. It doesn't mean that, that they actually agree with you. Thank you so much for watching. In the next chapter of The Gordian Knot, Valeri has a meeting with Poppy at the Russian Delicatessen and on the way to the Likotin novel, Poppy confronts George. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next chapter of The Gordian Knot. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.